13th chapter of John, 1 through 17. By the way, uh, last Sunday, uh, Tim Reese, as you know, done a marvelous job. And one of the things that he did that I want to try to incorporate, if I can find it, the uh, bitter print, <laughs> he read from the scripture, from the books that you have in your pews, and you were able to follow along better because it's, this, this is different somewhat than yours. And I thought, well, that's a great idea. I'm going to do that. But the only problem is I can't read it. Two dollars on small. <laughs> and so, and he said he even that he had trouble reading it too. So, uh, but if I can find a larger print like I have here, I'm going to get it. And we'll maybe I, you can follow along with me. But so far, all we have is the one that I have. You can look on the your Bibles and follow along the best you can. Now, before the festival of Passover, Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart from this world and go to the Father. Having loved his own who were in the world, and he loved them to the end. The devil had already put into the heart of Judas, son of Simon Iscariot, to betray him. And during the supper, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all the things into his hands, and they had come from God, and was going to God, got up from the table, took off his outer robe, tied a towel around himself, and he poured water into the basin, and began to wash the feet, and wiped them with the towel that was tied around him. This, folks, is the key. Christian faith. He came to Simon. He said to him, Lord, are you going to wash my feet? Jesus answered, you do not know what I'm doing, but later you will understand. Peter said to him, you will never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, unless I wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, well, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my feet and my head. Jesus said to him, one who has bathed does not need to wash except for his feet. He is entirely clean, and you are clean, though not all of you. For he knew who was betraying him. For this reason, he said, Not all of you are clean. After he had washed their feet, had put on his robe, and had returned to his table, he said to them, Do you know what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you're right, for that's what I am. So if I, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have set you an example that you also should do as I have done. Very truly I tell you, servants are not greater than their masters, nor are the messengers greater than the one who sent them. If you know these things, you are blessed. If you do them, that's the key. Welcome to this Monday Thursday celebration. I suspect if, like many of us, and I say that emphasizing us, I've been coming to this service for years without having any idea where the word Monty comes from. Anybody know what Monty means? Thank you. Yeah. It means clamant. Commandment. From the Latin word Mondatum, commandment. This day is called Monday Thursday because at the end of this scene, at the Last Supper, Jesus gave us a new commandment. So this could be Commandment Thursday. Commandment. Verse 34 and 35, we read this commandment. A new commandment I give you, love one another, as I have loved you, so that you must love one another. By this, everyone will know that you are my disciples if you love one another. That's it. Hume Scott Peck is a best-selling author, a respected psychiatrist, and a growing Christian. He said that this scene of Jesus washing the feet of the disciples stands out as one of the most significant events of Jesus' life, and I totally agree. This is a key to Christianity, as far as I'm concerned. You go through all of us, I know there's other things, but he said this, he said that. This is, the key. this is what it means to be a Christian. not easy. Until that moment, the whole point of things had been for someone to get on top. Once he gotten on top, stay on top, or else they'll get farther up the ladder, whatever that ladder of yours is. Now, if that sounds familiar, it should be, because that's the way it is today, isn't it? I mean, that's, that's, that's the theory. But here's this man who's already on top, who was a rabbi, Jesus, teacher, master, popular, my word, enormously popular, suddenly got down on the bottom and began to wash the feet of his followers. Unheard of, period. In that one act, 
time Jesus symbolically overturned the whole social order. And it would be true today. Hardly comprehending what was happening, those disciples, just like us, were horrified by his behavior. That doesn't, that doesn't work. It was a shocking act, then and today. So I said the scene. Jesus and the disciples were reclining on couches around the table eating the Passover meal. Every year, Passover meal, part of the Jewish tradition that he was a part of. Dr. Ray C. Stedman once noted, however, we have to get out of our minds the famous Leonardo da Vinci painting of the Last Supper. So we've got to get over that painting with everyone sitting on one side of the table. Now, da Vinci may have been a masterful artist, but he was very weak theologian. That's not how they sat at the table that evening. Trust me. They arranged themselves around a low, probably U-shaped table, and they reclined on their left elbow with their legs and feet sticking out diagonally from the table. That's the way they were. That's what it was always done. Another misconception in that painting is the angelic look of the disciples' faces as they gazed at Jesus. Look at that painting, some a powerful painting, but Luke records that they come to the end of the room arguing over who was going to be the greatest among them. Read the story. That was exactly what was happening. They were arguing about one another. It's no wonder that no one watched anyone's meeting. Generally, it's done at the very beginning of the meeting. When you come in, someone's there and does it. Everyone you see, the disciples, were playing mirror, mirror on the wall. Who's the greatest of them all? Literally. It's a strange scene. According to verse 13, Jesus and the disciples are celebrating the Passover meal. The dinner, however, has just come to an end, and so far, normal. Nothing different at this point. Then in verse 4, Jesus begins his shocking act. He stripped himself down to the garments of a common slave. That's what he did. That's what a common slave would wear. And washes the dust, mud, and sewage from the feet of the proud disciples. In that one decisive act, Jesus demonstrated that Christ's Christian greatness is not determined by position. Well, if I could just get that over on my, myself as well as everyone else, or prerogative, or education, or titles, or visibility, and none of that. It's not determined. That's not what great, Christian greatness is all about. Never has been, never will be. Christian greatness is determined by the willingness, listen to that, the willingness to meet the need of the moment with the need of service. Meet the need of the moment with the need of service. So what was the need of the moment? To wash the dirty feet. That's what he did. Quite an act. Master storyteller Fred, Dr. Fred Crabb tells about something that happened many years ago while he was driving cross country. He stopped at a small diner somewhere in the south to rest and have an early breakfast and some coffee. They're driving through the night and it was getting close to dawn and he was sleeping and needed some have rest as well as something to eat. As he waited for his breakfast order to come, Crab spied a black man who had just come in and had sat down on a stool by the lunch counter. The diner's manager then began to treat the black man with a contempt that was clearly born out of deep-seated racism. The manager was rude, insulting, demeaning toward his black guests. As he sat in his booth, his booth a little ways away from the counter, Dr. Craddock wrestled with whether to say something to this manager or not. I mean, concerning his racist comments about conduct. <coughs> he hesitated. Meanwhile, the black man quietly gulped down his some coffee and fled into the dark. Craddock remained silent. I didn't say anything, he confessed. I quietly paid my bill, left the diner, and headed back to my car. But as I was walking through the parking lot, somewhere in the distance, I heard the rooster crow. True story. You heard the rooster crow. One Sunday, Fred Craddock was a guest speaker at a church. And he preached a sermon with that story in it. After the service, a man came up to him in Narthex and shook Craddock's hand vigorously and said, Thank you, Pastor, for that powerful sermon. That's really what hit home. 
Oh, by the way, he said, what was the business with the rooster? You and I know about the business with the rooster, don't we? The story is told in chapter 13 of John's Gospel, and again in chapter 18, where Simon Peter hears the rooster crow and remembers Christ's words. I tell you the truth, before the rooster crows, you will disown me three times. Simon Peter way. Because of her. The realization of what he failed to do is just as powerful as the thing that we do. Let us pray. Father, we thank you for your love that's always there for us and with us as we live out our lives. In special times, you were there so very close, and we're so very thankful. We're thankful for you, Lord Jesus, who are willing to give your us, give yourself for us, not because we deserve it for these things, but just because you love us. Because you love us. The unconditional love that we don't understand. Son Jesus. In his name we pray. Amen. In number six nine.